So um, I'm just going to start with some quick housekeeping points. Um, we would like for everyone, if you can, to just keep your microphone on mute. That will just help us minimize the noise and the background noise. If you have questions, you can um, type them in the chat box. So as we found, there's top right corner, you see a little um, a speech bubble there. So you can click the speech bubble, and then you can either privately message them to me, or you can message them to the group. And we'll try to track of, track of them throughout the presentation and then answer anything else at the end. And anything we don't get to, I'm happy to follow up with you um, via email after the after the webinar is over. Um, yeah, so with that, I think we'll get started. Um, so I think you guys know that um, the Fulbright Association, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, you guys are all affiliate as chapters, you're affiliate members of our organization. We have about 54 chapters and we have some chapters who are working on getting up and running. Um, hopefully we'll have some more added to our network in this coming year. Um, so you guys as chapters, you will fall underneath all of our guidelines and our role here is just to support you guys. So we hope that this webinar will be a good overview of, you know, all of the things that you guys do as leaders and how you can engage with you with your members um, and hopefully everything we go over will be useful for you as kind of a overview. Um, also we understand that as an overview we can't go too in depth with everything but we do have some resources on our website which I'm happy to share with you guys. You can always email us and um, today we're covering kind of the, the, meaty, the meaty things that we have to do um, to keep our chapters running and to keep our members Hello. Hi, Lisa. How are you? So, do we get to introduce ourselves? So, there's so there's seven, of seven of us. I think for uh, simplicity purposes, we will hold off the introductions of everyone. We did have everyone put their name and name and position in the box so we can kind of get a sense of who's here. I think just but I think just the time going, time going we'll off. hold off on introductions. Uh, now, we'll now we'll just get to it. Get to it. Okay. That sounds okay. Um, I think we have everyone mute. Uh, so I just wanted to say, like, I cannot find the bubble where I could type my chat. It, I mean, initially in the beginning when I logged in, I could see it, but I can't see it now. I'll try to figure out how to get there. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Okay, everyone. Hi, it's great to... Um, be with you this lovely morning. It's about 42 degrees here. So it's not so lovely, but anyway, it's better than being snowed in. Um, we are um, primarily, I wanted to share this. This presentation was put together as a result of the feedback we received at the chapter workshop in October last year. We even have uh, some findings from uh, some of the comments that some of the chapters made for various parts of the chapter workshop. After this workshop, we will be uh, sharing even those documents with each of you. Um, this is primarily to help the new chapter leaders. We have ex uh, discovered that uh, there is no, uh, when the, there is a turnover or there is a new leadership put in place, uh, there is no, uh, there's no transfer of instructions from the previous leadership to the new leadership. Um, uh, many of you find reading the chapter handbook probably a bit cumbersome. It's detailed, but a lot of stuff is in it. But we thought if we just highlight all what chapters are, what their primary roles are, what our role is, what we expect from chapters annually. It kind of makes it easier. And then this is going to be a video that would be available for Um, I, am I muted? Oh, sorry. No, um, we need to have sort of more uniformity around that. 
we are looking at uh, all our bylaws and seeing how we can sort of implement a timeline that all chapters follow rather than what the handbook says, you know, in the summer or in the winter, based on our cycle, all chapters should have their elections at the end of the year in winter. But, um, you know, these are the things we're exploring, but we haven't changed them for now. They are what they are. Um, and we have various chapter cycles. Um, the staff, I, this is important to emphasize. Um, I do oversee the chapters and the chapter work, but the primary contact and lead from our office for chapters is Lisa. Um, so any issues you have regarding anything to do with chapters, please make sure that you email Lisa. If you do email other staff in the office, um, you're welcome to do that anytime. If it's a chapter related question or activity, um, even if it is having John come to have a speaking engagement or me having told you something about, oh, you can roll over chapter funds, from the chapter grant, some old conversation that I and I, you have shared, make sure Lisa is still copied because this she needs to have a have a whole view of what what you're all doing and what the open issues are or what new issues are. Um, Munir is our senior data and marketing analyst. Um, he is also the support for all chapters where it comes to communications with the website, um, trying to log in, setting up an admin account in your membership, which is our database. So that's where you should um, connect with him. But again, keep Lisa looped in that you're communicating with him on these matters, because ultimately she will have the whole picture of what all chapters need. Um, we have two new staff members. We have our development manager is Naomi. She's just joined us uh, mid-December and we have an administrative assistant, um, Christine Oswald, and she's just joined um, two weeks ago. So, uh, and she, our staff is uh, very, um, you know, very interesting. So feel free to talk to them about their backgrounds and their experiences and get to know everyone. So we thought it would be good for you to have a picture of who we are and how this office actually uh, operates. So we could change the slide to this chart. I thought that this chart would be interesting. Again, a lot of, um, and I don't, uh, you know, I, I apologize. I don't blame any of you for the confusions at times. Um, but I thought that this organizational chart will show you the different aspects of different roles different staff members um, have and their what they do. So this is sort of the structure. We're a very small office, but um, we do a lot. So um, going on to the next slide. Um, I, I'm just going to emphasize this and then I'm handing the presentation over to Lisa. Um, we are obviously a 501c3 and we, our tax exemption covers all chapters for federal uh, tax exemption. Uh, we'll talk in more detail about taxes. For now, I'm just going to say we set the policy. Uh, we have chapters that are affiliates of the um, uh, national organization, so to speak, where the mothership, I guess. And then we have these chapters that are very independent, but at the same time, there are three requirements that they have to fulfill. That's, you know, maintaining the uh, stat, uh, stat, uh, their tax status, uh, reporting annually to us about all the activities, their finances, and their board minutes uh, of meetings, their board officers, they have to have annually. These are very important matters. Um, uh, can we have everyone mute, please? I, 
here we go. All right. So um, we uh, we maintain the group tax exemption. We report on you guys' behalf collectively to IRS. We also expect all new chapters to give us their new EIN number when they apply for it. Chapters are required to apply for their own taxes, uh, but we report on the overall group. We have a director and off insurance policy. All our chapters are covered under that, just as our board, our national board members. Um, all chapter leaders are covered in the same policy. So that's a great thing. Uh, you guys uh, will be getting a copy of that for your records. We collect membership dues and we give a 10% share of all the dues we collect for those chapters. Those are only, they're available twice a year, um, June uh, 1st January to June 30th, and then July 1 to December 31st. But chapters qualify for those rebates only and if they fulfill all the reporting requirements. And the biggest one is the annual report. We'll get into all these details, but I'm giving you a little background as I'm going through these um, uh, points. Um, maintaining a database of alumni providing membership data to chapters that includes your by um, quarterly lists you get, updated lists of members, uh, current uh, members of the association that fall under the chapter jurisdiction. My, you know, we give you programmatic advice and we maintain the website, online event calendar, newsletters, opportunities for chapters to publicize their events. So at this point, this is our, our role. I'm going to hand over the presentation to Lisa. Oh, this is, sorry, this is uh, one more part. I, I've, I've missed the slide. The maintaining a chapter advisory board. Okay, so in 2014, we created the CAB, uh, which was actually a result, again, of many trainings at, in DC, in Chicago, in chapter workshops, in a need for chapters to connect with one another, communicate with one another. This is a independent board from chapter boards, but it is mandatory. And I stress this point, it is mandatory for chapters to have a designated representative to be on CAB. Now CAB has a chair and a vice chair and about 10 directors. Each director has a set of five to six chapters under their um, jurisdiction. So it is a it is a form forum in a way a platform for you to communicate with each other, share your your updates, learn best practices, share your um, even challenges, and then the director brings it to the advisory board meeting, and then these these issues are actually discussed, and we try to come up with a solution to help chapters. Now, if you don't have a chapter representative, you don't know what's happening in CAB. And the other new thing you will see a change from February, as soon as we have all of you send Lisa a name of who your CAB rep will be, you will start getting updates from CAB as to what they're doing, minutes of their meetings, so that everybody is openly um, you know, able to join the discussion and also be updated with what's happening. Uh, again, this is very important that you just designate a chapter rep annually. The other part is advocacy. As advocacy is a mission of the FA, alumni is, engagement is at the heart of ECA initiatives. That's the chapter grant. We'll talk about that later. Each chapter must have an advocacy director for spearheading local advocacy in the state. Again, a lot of focus by chapters is on visiting Fulbrights, visiting Fulbrighters um, uh, enrichment activities. That is not a focus of the chapter grant at this point. Uh, the whole shift is on alumni engagement and advocacy, even though it's not part of the chapter grant, it is part of our mission. It's part of the annual reporting you do to us. So keep this in mind as we go through this presentation, we need a CAB rep, we need an advocacy director and more than 50% of the chapters do not have an advocacy director at this time. At this point, I really am handing it over to Lisa because 
now we talk about the chapter role. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shaz. Okay, so we are going to talk about uh, the role of the chapter and the chapter leaders. So the most important thing, the most important guiding document that you guys have are the bylaws and the chapter handbook, which can be found on our website. Um, we're gonna go through kind of the main highlights of those documents here, um, but you can definitely read that more extensively in on the website and I can send it out after the webinar as well. So the chapters are in charge of contacting alumni in the area, inviting them to participate in chapter activities. As Shaz mentioned, um, we really wanna focus on engaging returned alum. Um, and while we love to engage our visiting Fulbrighters and we think they add so much to our community, we also wanna make sure that we're reaching out to those alum because visiting Fulbrighters already have support and they already have lots of activities to go to. So we want to make sure that we're continuing this mission of the Fulbright um, experience and continuing cultural understanding. We ask that all chapters implement um, at least two events per, per year. So typically um, this can be like a welcome event in the fall and then, you know, some type of a wrap up of the year at the end if you were to do kind of the, the minimum. And then of course you are welcome to do as many events as you have the capacity to do in your chapters. Um, as you know, we have the chapter grant. So anyone who is applying to this chapter grant and receives some funding can probably do a little bit more. So we definitely encourage you to take, um, take advantage of that opportunity. The events should um, be designed to allow discussions of international issues, to welcome Fulbrighters, especially alum, to um, allow this communication about cultural exchange to continue. We want to give our members the opportunity to learn um, and participate um, with each other and learn from their experiences and continue to share. Uh, we also ask that chapters advocate for the Fulbright program by developing relationships with your representatives at the state level. So um, like Shaw said, we are going to ask for um, every chapter to send us their advocacy representative. And having someone we think on the chapter who's in charge of this will help streamline our advocacy process a little bit more, help us um, get our message out to you guys. Um, so we hope that that will be something useful for you to have on your chapter. And then lastly, we also ask that chapters submit your annual report and your financial reports, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the basic structure of a chapter is we have our executive members, the president, the vice president, the treasurer, and the secretary, and then you can have up to 15 board members. We do ask that all members are current members of the Fulbright Association. So I periodically check in with people about this. Um, we, we can check on our system here if they're members, and that's just um, a basic requirement for anyone who's going to be on the board, as well as members. We hope that the people who are coming to your events are also members of the association and we hope that you're encouraging people to pay their dues. Um, this is how we can support you better and do better programming if people are involved and uh, members of our association. So I'll talk a little bit about the chapter bylaws, but um, I want to mention just again that this is kind of Three highlights, um, three of the most important parts of the bylaws. The bylaws are more extensive and they can be found online. Um, but the first, as I mentioned, is membership. All chapter uh, members and all chapter leaders must be current members of the Fulbright Association. You can always tell people that the first year um, that they've returned from their Fulbright, they get a free year of membership. So we hope that once they have that free year of membership, after that, they will continue to stay engaged and remain members of the association. Um, the board of directors, uh, this is also highlighted in our bylaws. You guys are so important and we're so grateful for your work. This is what keeps um, Fulbrighters together and what keeps engagement going. Um, the board of directors are, are there for providing oversight of activities, um, to do reporting and to manage the finances of the chapter. We hope that the board of directors are holding regular meetings um, whenever, you know, some do them monthly, some do them a little less frequently. I think that it would depend mostly on how many events you're having, um, but you should be checking in, you know, a few times a year. The meetings can be either in person or they can be on the phone. I know some of our larger states have that where they have board, board members all over the state and they check in on the phone or check in Zoom or go to meeting. Um, we just hope that you're checking in 
and reporting back to each other about what's going on. Um, I know I've seen some NCAC, our wonderful chapter in DC, they have um, each of their members uh, is in charge of uh, their own event. So they're really great at kind of organizing their events and distributing that responsibility across the chapter and holding really awesome, really amazing events for so many Fulbrighters in DC. Uh, the last thing is elections. So the nominations for elections must be open to the entire chapter. We do this through our office. So when it's time for you to have an election, um, we will send out um, to all of the members a survey that asks for a call for nominations. And any member of the chapter can submit someone that they would like to nominate for a position on the board. After that's done, we will collect all of the responses and we will send them back out to the current board. Um, or we will send them back out to the current members and we will ask them to vote on who they would like to be put in those positions. After that is done, we will collect those responses and then send them out in a mass email to the entire chapter. We like our elections to be open and transparent. And we think that doing this allows for um, new people to come in and get involved with the chapter rather than just keeping it within the executive board or within the board of directors on their own. We like to open it up for the whole chapter, for the whole state or region, so that as many Fulbrighters who are willing to get involved would like to come and join. And that will just probably add for really diverse and interesting events. Um, the officers will serve one-year terms, and the presidents will serve two-year terms. Um, this can be renewable once. And um, we hope that if there are any, you know, if anyone... We realize situations are different across different states and different chapters. So if there ever is, you know, some chapter that's having a difficulty with the bylaws of the elections or recruiting new members, that they would always reach out to us because we are happy to assist. That's why we're here to support you. And we're so happy to assist you in your nominations and elections process. And we hope that we can be helpful for you in recruiting new members and getting new leadership on the board. So now we'll focus a little bit on events. Um, this is kind of from State Department as well as from our office. We want the chapter events to focus on diversity. So events that are of a wide range of um, interest to different members and that the events are varied in content. So we hope that not every single event that you hold is a happy hour, that maybe you're holding like a Fulbright forum. So it's an opportunity for people to learn or you're doing a hike or something outside. So we hope that the events are are different so that you can engage as many people as possible. We also want to um, have the events focus on community engagement. So that means promoting the chapter, promoting the Fulbright Association and the Fulbright program itself um, and engaging as many people as possible that are within those networks. And then lastly, we want events that focus on alumni and young professional networking. So chapters should be actively recruiting young alumni and holding events that build on the experience of return Fulbright alum. One way you can do this is that by using your member list, which we send to you every fall, you'll see who has, who's on the list, when they've done their Fulbright, and you can kind of get a sense for who's in the area and hopefully use those lists to reach out to members who want to get engaged. A little bit more on events, uh, the Fulbright forums, we've talked about this Many of you are already doing Fulbright forums, so this is when you do like speakers, when you have panels, when it's something for learning um, and educational purposes. We want these to be branded as Fulbright forums so that this is something um, we can talk about doing across chapters across the country. Fulbright in the Classroom is another amazing opportunity to bring mutual understanding to a K-12 audience. Um, in our office, we're also currently working on making this program better and more accessible to members across the country, even if they're not close to a chapter. But if you have ideas or want to talk about Fulbright in the Classroom, definitely send me an email and I would love to chat with you about that opportunity. After the events, we do ask if they are um, major events that you submit an event report to our office. Um, and especially if they're a major event that you inform our office before the event so that we can help you publicize that these great events that you guys do. Um, if your event is supported by the chapter grant, um, which I know that's not all of you, but if it is uh, supported by grant funds, we ask for the event reports to be submitted within two weeks of the date you held that event. And lastly, when you do have your finalized list, let's say for spring 
or the upcoming semester and you have your finalized dates of each event, we do ask that you send them to us. You can send them to me at lisa at fulbright.org and I will load them onto our national calendar. This is a great way that we can see all of the great events that chapters are doing all over the country. And it's a great way for people who are kind of cruising our website to get a sense of what we do. We want to highlight your events. You guys do awesome things. So please, when you have them, send them to me and I'm happy to publicize. So we're going to shift a little bit to annual reporting. Uh, you guys should know that the annual report is coming up on February 15th. Um, when you submit this report, as long as you submit it on time by the deadline, February 15th, you will get your membership rebate. Um, this is something that our office will calculate for you. We'll, we'll calculate all of the members who have paid their dues in the last six months, and your chapter will get a 10% rebate from that um, sum. So this is a way that we're trying to help you to have great events, to fund your own events. Um, so please make sure you submit those annual reports by the deadline so that we can get you your rebate. Um, in the report, it just includes processes, results of elections, um, a list of board members that is updated, and reporting of your events and fundraising initiatives. Um, so hopefully it shouldn't take too much time if you have different people on your chapter engaged in different um, areas. So hopefully you have someone who's, you know, the treasurer is in charge of finance and someone else is doing events. Hopefully everyone can come together and pull those documents together and send them as the annual report. Yes. Hi, I'm back. I was just trying to get my camera so everyone can see that I now need reading glasses and I'm aging fast. Um, chapter banking and IRS requirements are very simple. Chapters are required to file a online post. It's called a po e-postcard. It's a 990N, it's very simple. Um, and it's you're supposed to send us the email you get after that that confirming you filed. Um, the banking, um, okay, so let's, let me go step by step on this. For those of you that are new, some of you, I will give an example. I don't know if anyone's from Nebraska on the uh, call. But yes. Nebraska is a new chapter, and they've just they they filed they applied for an EIN number. They're applying for a bank account. Bank accounts. Uh, many of the um, bank uh, bankers ask for a um, letter from us and our uh, our uh, articles of incorporation, which is actually a legal document that says who we are, how we came into existence and uh, the date we were created as a nonprofit. Chapters don't need to create that for themselves. They can use ours. That's all. We are the mother organization. You're affiliates, and hence you fall under the same umbrella. I, when asked, sometimes bank accounts are opened without any uh, requests from, for letters from us, but when they do ask for more information, I send a letter that says here are the board members of the chapter and they were chartered on this date and they're an affiliate of the um, FA uh, under our uh, federal tax ID. And this is their ID. Um, please help them open a account. And as they're a nonprofit, they should not be charged any banking fees. That's the ideal, but sometimes banks don't always honor that same status. Um, to apply for an EIN number, you know, for those of you that are new, you just go online, you see how it is, you, you choose the chapter, there is an affiliate category, and you apply. The treasurer should, that should be part of the treasurer's role. Um, and then a copy of that can be sent to us that you have been authorized and are good to go as a chapter of the Fulbright Association. Let me change the slide. Uh, the IRS gives you this, you know, gives you um, under our group tax exemption, the same umbrella. Um, we can give you the ruling of our 
federal tax exemption if you want that. Some banks want that too. Um, you do not have to pay federal taxes, but you do have, um, this does not include state, state uh, taxes, which we'll talk about later. We, you can have up to, it used to be 25,000. Now you can have up to $50,000 in your bank account. Uh, I wish we did have chapters that had that kind of money, um, but that means that you don't have to report on anything 50 and below. Um, and we talked about this at the chapter workshop, um, how to fundraise from your communities um, and sort of, you know, to boost your own um, revenue streams, because it is never guaranteed that we'll get a chapter grant every year. Uh, the chapter membership rebate is also a modest amount. It includes institutional rebates as well. Um, so if an institution signs up at $1,000, the chapter gets 100. But still, it's not a lot of money. So chapters should be looking at other revenue streams as they are programming throughout the year. And many board, uh, many donors in the state will send us a donation uh, earmarked for the chapter. So we get it, and then we reissue the check to the chapter. And so it is a good thing to um, cultivate some of your donors that might be interested in the programming you do. Also to know who, who lives in your city, you know, what's their, uh, what's their uh, background? What's, what kind of um, programs are they interested in? And you can always call our office and talk to our uh, development manager, even John, if you have to, uh, you want to know more about fundraising initiatives and you know whether we know this person whether it's appropriate to do the ask or not so that's a side thing um the uh next slide is about the local taxes we get a lot of questions about this chapters are responsible for applying for local tax state tax exemption we don't do that we have a DC tax exemption. So luckily our national capital area chapter can use that for their events and be exempt from paying sales tax, but Virginia doesn't accept it. We actually um, come to think of it, we've just uh, applied and gotten a, uh, approved for the Virginia state tax exemption. So actually we could share that with our Virginia chapters. But beyond that, many states don't take our DC state exemption. So it is of no use to, for you all to have that. Um, you open your own account, you maintain your own account. Um, and the correct way of listing your account is, for example, the Nebraska chapter for Bright Association. Um, I, I use Nebraska, oh, I, um, I, I use Nebraska because that's a new one that's just opened. Um, the other thing is that mostly we have two people listed on the account for signing authority. One's the treasurer and one's either the president or president. This is something chapters are independent to decide on and follow as they please. Next slide. Um, now we'll come, I, I, I'll take questions about taxes at the end, if anyone has them, because I know this is a very tricky question. Many chapters ask this question, but I want you to know that we do write letters. So anything you're having problems with, you're not alone trying to struggle with trying to find out how to do this. Call Lisa. Um, you can also email me or call me, call, email both of us and say, this is the problem you're having. How do I address it? Can you assist? And we will try our best to get you letters. We have templates for bank letters, not a problem. You should not have to struggle on these things. Um, I, I go back to the... Um... Now, the chapter grant proposals. Now, as Lisa talked about the annual report, events, programs, a lot of chapters are confused about the grant and the annual report. The annual report has to be filed annually, irrespective of whether you filed chapter event summaries or not. It is an independent document that legally binds you guys to us. 
it, sh it should show us that you are doing events, you're participating in advocacy, you're utilizing communication channels, you are having meetings, board meetings, you are having elections, and then your bank statement that this is how much you have in your account. Because if you let's hypothetically, let's say you have 51,000 in your bank account, we would want to know that we're, we're, we're in trouble there. Of course, this has never happened, but it's just an example I'm giving you. So that is a requirement and independent of any other reporting. Chapter grants, not all chapters apply for it annually. It is a grant we get from ECA and that is State Department's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. They allocate the amount and then they send the funding to IIE and IIE gives us that funding. So it funnels through IIE to us. So I'm just giving you the details. We have a lot of reporting requirements to IIE for the grant, which is why at the end of the year, we're always saying, please submit your event summaries. Tell us, did you spend all the money? Um, and again, all chapters don't apply for the grant. So out of the 54 chapters, 40 chapters applied for the grant this year, this, uh, this past 2019 uh, cycle. So all chapters have the same qualification that they have to apply, uh, submit an annual report. The grant reporting is only based on if you have submitted a grant proposal and are conducting events funded by the chapter grant. And if you do use money from the chapter grant for a chapter event, then you have to submit an event summary within two weeks of the event finishing. You also have to let us know in advance that this event is happening and it should be on our calendar and we should be able to share this information with ECA because they get very upset that they don't know about an event. And, and, and an example is, um, I don't know if any of the Greater New York Chapter board members are on the call, but there was an event yesterday in New York and we did not have a confirmed date for it. Uh, we knew it was in their grant proposal. And so ECA didn't find out till a day before and that caused a lot of irritation at the top level. So we, we get a lot of pressure from ECA, IIE for financial reporting, and generally using the communication tools that we have provided our chapters. I mean, you really need to tell us about the events you're doing, they confirmed, um, so that we can highlight them on our calendar, highlight them in the community, and also highlight them in State Department so they are aware of all the alumni engagement activities happening all over the country. Um, the chapter grant is very tight in its timeline. We don't find out till August how much we're getting and we cannot send out a call for proposals till about mid-August and then the chapters have very little time, less than a month to apply, put their whole annual activities together. And you can only imagine if you're a new chapter board member, you've just been elected in the summer, you're going to be scrambling saying, oh my God, what do I do? You can always contact us to share a previous proposal of the chapter if the outgoing leadership hasn't shared with you. We have, documenta we have documentations of many years. We can help you also plan for your activities. So you should utilize the resources available to you by asking us to help. We, we try not to interfere in the independence of the chapter and the work they do, but we are here as a resource. So that's, I just wanted to explain why the timeline is so short and it's always a scramble, but we, we just don't have much control. I wish ECA would tell us in June, hey, you guys have $200,000 to give to your 54 chapters. Um, and we would say, oh, great. By June, we know July, we send out a call for proposals. You guys have two months to apply and we're good. So anyway, um, next slide. Uh, I just wanted you to know a bit about the background. Chapter grant proposals continuing 
Um, the fiscal year starts October 1, ends June 30th. So all grant funds must be utilized within that period. They let you roll over most of the time fall funds for spring. But for the last two, three years, we've not had permission to roll over funds. So know that you have to use those funds by June 30th. And you have to fit, submit the final report by July 1 to us, because we have to get all your reports and submit our final report to IIE by July 31st. Imagine having 40 chapters send us all their reports and in one month, we don't have wiggle room. So we request that you have that in mind that you start closing your chapter grant reporting by the end of June. Events outside of both dates are not funded through the grant, but chapters can use other sources Sometimes chapters call me and ask if they can prepay for an event in August. We have sometimes allowed that. It's also all dependent on whether the funding from I, uh, ECA is valid till the end of the year or that they have to report by August. So again, you have to talk to me about, or Lisa about whether actually Lisa about um be paying for events in august um they will not fund your activity if you have something cited for september so it's not a surprise they go by their fiscal year i just wanted to stress that visiting fulbright list i'm getting a lot of questions about this i just want you all to know we get them one time from eca very late sometimes late september and we turn around and quickly divide them by chapters and send them on to you guys. They do not provide any updates on those lists later in the year. They do not keep renewing those lists with us. So the one time we send it, we send it to the designated official of the chapter who has signed a list usage guide. The person who communicates, who's the communication uh, director on the chapter needs those lists. All board members do not need to be independently emailing um, chapters, but uh, sorry, uh, visiting Fulbrighters and members, but you should have a designated person. Um, and that's the best practice on this. Um, you can, if you're on a campus, you could find lists of people yourselves. If you have a good relationship with a Fulbright program advisor, or you know the the, the director of the international office that's uh, managing the Fulbrighters that have come in, they will give you those lists happily. But that's a personal relationship you have to develop yourself. Let's keep going next. Okay, now I'm turning it over to Lisa. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly go over the branding guidelines. Uh, we have some examples here. So you guys all know that we have a new logo that was launched in the spring and everyone has a chapter logo. You have the color one and you have the white one. Um, we have the color one with a blank background. We hold all of those logos in our office. So if you are for some reason missing them for your chapter, please send me an email and let me know and I'm happy to send you your logos so that you can use them for your publications and communications. When you do use the logo, please make sure you follow the branding guidelines. We have very specific branding guidelines. You can find them on our website under chapter resources. But the main um, things that are important to keep in mind are um, one, the spacing. So as you can see with this picture here with the National Geographic and IIE, the general rule of thumb is one globe of space should always be surrounding our logo. Um, and then also just to remember when you're using the logo, make sure that you don't use the logo on a busy or low contrast photograph like the one on the bottom right. The logo should always be clearly visible when you're using it. Um, we cannot alter the colors of the logo. They are specific colors. We have our three special Fulbright colors um, and in the branding guidelines, it will tell you exactly what those are. I can also send them to you if you ever wanna use them for a publication or something that you're printing. You can use our Fulbright Legacy Blue. It's a really nice color. It's the background color for the slide. Um, and then also we cannot add any graphic elements. We cannot alter the logo in any way. So the logo is sacred to the State Department and we have to keep it sacred. 
Um, and one last thing that I did want to mention, I know that we have so many platforms to um, keep up with these this day and age. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have websites, we have things all over. Please make sure you go through um, everything for your chapter and you change the logo to the new one. I have noticed that there are some Facebooks, um, Facebook pages that still use the old logo and some websites might still have the old logo. So please make sure you have um, whether it's your secretary or someone else who's tech savvy on your board, go through all of your platforms and change the logo over. If you ever want to use just the um, social media icon, you can just use the globe. I can also send that to you if you don't have it and you want me to send you an email um, with the globe link. Just try to make sure we have consistency throughout our platforms and across our network. And now we just have a couple of deadlines for you guys. I know I had some questions um, about that in the chat. So if you want to, um, I'll definitely send this uh, presentation out to you. So you will have these deadlines in your records. Um, just some ones to keep in mind. As we know, the one coming up is February 15th for the annual report. Um, we have tax deadlines as well. If you are interested in submitting an application for to receive a chapter grant, if they're available when it's time in the, in the summer, um, that usually happens around August. Um, like Shaz mentioned, you'll be receiving your visiting Fulbrighter list in the fall. Again, some of these things are kind of at the whim of the State Department when they decide to give us our member list or when they tell us the grant is available. Uh, but we do try to move through them as quickly as possible. And just one thing to keep in mind is that um, if we can stay on top of this calendar um, and we can stay organized and stay within our deadlines, that helps us help you better. So as long as we're not scrambling with last minute uh, grant proposals and things like that, we can give you the best service because that's why we're here. We want to support you guys. And the best way for you to help us is make sure you submit everything on time, which is great. And uh, just a few other follow-up items, kind of miscellaneous here. Uh, please make sure you copy chapters at Fulbright.org on all communications to members. We just like to be in the know about what's going on in the chapter network um, across chapters. And once you have your finalized event dates, uh, I would love for you to send those to me kind of in one complete document to chapters at Fulbright.org. I will promote them for you. I will put them on our calendar. Um, I would love to know when they are so that we can talk about them on our social media, in our newsletter. We are here to support you, as I said, so we want to make sure that we can have all of the information from your chapters and get them out to members. If you have a member or a board member who would like to write a blog and put it in our newsletter, or if you have something you want to highlight in our publications, please just let me know. We're happy to support you and highlight you and talk about all the great things you're doing. Uh, next is the chapter resources. I've mentioned this a few times. If you go on our website and you click under chapters, then it should say uh, chapter resources, and then there's a link for general resources. We have most of these things we've talked about here, the annual report template, um, the branding guidelines, the bylaws, and the handbook. Everything is in that space on our website, and it's there for you to use. And uh, last piece of information, we have ordered flags. We're very excited. We have uh, three foot by two foot flags that will say Fulbright Association and your chapter name. They should be coming in probably in the next couple weeks. And as soon as we have them, we will mail them out to you so you can use them at events and bring them with you and take awesome pictures and send them to us. And we can publicize those pictures. Okay, so we are going to open it up for questions. Um, it might be best for best everyone to kind of put your questions, put your questions chat, in the chat, um, and we can kind of, um, talk, through kind of talk through them if, you know, there's something that we see. Before we take questions, I have, um, I've been looking at some of the questions we're getting on the side. I just want to clarify. Uh, Rui, I think you're on the call. Um, you don't need to apply for a new EIN number. One EIN number is for a lifetime for your chapter, but annually you have to file taxes. Every year, the tax deadline for chapters is May 15th. And it's an online process, which most of your treasurers are doing. So <clears throat> if you don't apply for taxes for two years, we get a notice. Three years later, they inactivate you. And the reinst reinstating uh, cost is uh, quite uh, steep. So I recommend that you have um, some kind of mechanism that your 
um, treasurer does file taxes annually. Most of our chapters do it. It's very simple, really. Um, and the other question I saw was annual report. Now, annual report, again, I'm stressing this, is a different report. And Lisa, when we send this um, presentation to everybody, let's make sure we send that annual report. It has nothing to do with the chapter grant. Um, e even though you can report on the chapter grant activities in your annual report, you're required to report on everything you've done from January 1 of the year previous year. So this year it's 2020, you're filing for January 1, 2019 to Jan December 31st, 2019. So everything you did in that year, you need to just tell us about it. That's that's all it is. So I just want you to know there are two different types of reporting, but annual report is just overall. You, you actually send us a list of your board members with their emails um, and and uh, minutes of your meetings. You know, that's 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 compliance issues. So I hope I've answered those two questions. Is there a deadline for election? Uh, oh, there's another question that we we are seeing is uh, election deadlines. Um, this is a this is a problem, and we are trying to review um, our bylaws. Um, Chapters prefer doing elections in summer when they're done with the school year, and before people when people are free from their uh, semesters or work. You know, summer travel is there, so it's easier. They want to do their elections then. But according to our organizational bylaws, it should be done in the fall. In October, by December, you have new leadership in place. Some of the chapters don't like that deadline because they say new leadership is coming in the middle of the year when the grant has already started, and they're not able to recommend types of activities, they have to continue with the activities laid out by the previous administration. So I've heard those kind of issues. Um, the other issue is, oh, we can't have elections at that time of the year. We're just going to stick to the summer summer uh, deadline. I know it's hard for me to say this, and it's been hard for many chapters to hear this, leaders. Our bylaws are obviously law, and that's how our chapter needs to be run. But because of the nature of our community, all of you are volunteers with real jobs. And this is a volunteer thing. When on a case by case, when things are discussed with us, we have some exemptions that we are able to provide uh, each chapter. Some chapters say they can't uh, recruit board members, and so they want a little time over the two year limit. Some chapters say, oh, there's, we're just three alumni in the community. How do we find more people? So, you know, these are things you need to bring to us and we need to discuss them on, on a need to know basis. Um, uh, be able to help you guys. The other thing I want to make a note of is in 2014, we started CAB. In 2017, we started Fulbright in the classroom initiative for chapters. We piloted it with chapters. We still do. It's an, uh, it's an established, um, well-run program by chapters. In 2018, 2019, we rebranded something, which a forum, and we called it the Fulbright Forum. Now, any panel discussions you guys have can easily fall under the branding of Fulbright Forum. So if you, NCAC is having a um, a, a, a event uh, next week, I think, um, or this week. It has, it, it, they've not, it's on foreign policy that could easily be branded as a Fulbright Forum. The, que the reason is that by using that branding, you're making
some reason, but So just keep those those issues in mind. Yes, yes, Fernando, you should say you should say Fulbright form instead of speaker series. I mean, it just it it's just you know. And if you record these things, or if we record them, we can actually have an archive of Fulbright forms. Uh, available for people all around the world to look at. And we are not yet quite um, ready to launch the Fulbrighter app, but we're building a space around our, our, our app that will be hosting all these resources for people to see. Our next step is uh, once we launch it, we're going to build out the chapter space. So each chapter will have their own app space. You could upload your own presentations, discussions, videos on your space, on the app that would be viewed by people, all Fulbrighters. It's only a Fulbrighter app, so only Fulbrighters at the moment can access, but many Fulbrighters can view it. So I want you to keep these things in mind. You know, how can we market, not market, sorry, highlight the great work you guys are doing and 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 you know and that also might you never know who might see the stuff you're doing and want to fund your next venture in the state um so we really have to be rethinking how we manage things as chapters So, Rui, I see your question. You're not supposed to provide tax info to your state of North Carolina. You're supposed to file online for IRS purposes because you're an affiliate. But if you want state tax exemption, and I'll give you an example. You're doing an event at a restaurant and they will bill you for state tax. Let's say it's a big event. It's a $3,000 bill, $200 is state tax. You, if you have state tax exemption, you will save the $200 for your chapter. Does that make sense? That's how you use the state tax exemption. But we cannot provide it for you because we cannot sit and apply for each state tax exemption for our chapter because we are headquartered in DC. We qualify for certain states, actually Virginia and DC, which we have gotten, but we sort of can't do this for all 50 states, but the chapter can, and we can provide you documents to help you get that. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge with the Maine chapter because Maine's state doesn't accept educational organizations like us. So we're also a unique nonprofit. So our status is sort of not so clear in many state app, uh, tax exemption applications, but we have to be creative. So I'm working with Maine. I haven't quite cracked how we're doing this, but we're trying to figure out how we can qualify for one of their listed organizations types and apply for, uh, I mean, help them apply for it so that they get it. But you should all think about this. This can save you tons of money in state taxes for events. Um, and also note that you are covered by the director and officer's insurance policy that we have in the office. So that, that, that should give you some relief. Oh, some chapters also ask for 
uh, waiver forms, we do have templates. If you're taking a group of alumni and students on trips, Mid Florida does that, North Florida, Georgia chapter does uh, these trips from time to time, overnight ones. Um, you can have that template and customize it for your chapter so that you can have everyone going on that trip sign and, you know, say not hold the chapter leadership or are all volunteers responsible. There's so many resources we have. We are trying to put them in one place so that you just go onto the site and just download these forms. We will try and put all these there. But uh, another suggestion came to me by um, um, Amela, who is the president of the Mid Florida chapter. She just communicated with me yesterday saying, can you put a one sheet with deadlines clearly for all of us so we know new, new leaders that come in, what we are supposed to do? I thought that was a very good idea. Uh, we have this already in the presentation, but what we'll do is we create a one pager for you guys, again, a resource that we can edit from every annually each year um, and have it available for you guys. And Munir um, is available to help you troubleshoot any website issues you might have. Any email issues, you have an email to use, that's Fulbright.org. You have a website. We have linked all the chapters that have current websites. We've linked them to the website already. We have the same URL so that if someone clicks on our homepage to go to your chapter website, it goes to the one you've already developed. Um, we prefer uniform branding, but we're not going to hold chapters back from having the websites developed already using them. So just keep all these things in mind that we're all here. Um, there are many chapters that request um, us to come and speak. Uh, John, uh, our executive director, goes to many of the chapter activities as well. I've been to some. Uh, in some cases, Lisa will be available to come for some. Uh, so keep that in mind that, um, and we try and do that at no burden to the chapter. So if you want us to come and it's something that we can work within our budget and piggyback with other meetings, then we would make as many accommodations as we can to attend the event and be part of it. We have other questions. I think let's just answer this one last one about the annual report. Sure. From Fernando, do you see it? Um, I thought I did. Um, but the annual report funds that we have as reserves do not need to be reported, right? We only have to focus on grant funded. Okay, no, Fernando, this is this is the confusion. You're you're mixing the two. It says the annual report has nothing to do with the grant. The annual report is saying this, you will submit a bank statement that this is what what you had at the end of the year, 31st of December 2019. What was the balance in your bank account? You do share that. But it has nothing to do with grant funds. It's just generally your a report summarizing the health and the functions of your chapter in one given year and this is 2019. i hope that makes sense sure that's we're going we're going to thank you i think we're going to wrap up at this point if there are no more questions Thank you guys so much for taking the time to join us for this webinar. I hope that it was useful to chapter leaders and especially to the new chapter leaders. I hope we were able to clarify some of your questions. If you have lingering questions or you're still, you know, wondering about some things, please, um, you can send me an email anytime. You can send it to my direct email, lisa at fulbright.org. And I'm happy to follow up with you about any leftover questions you have. We will be um, saving this recording and sending it out to um, all of you and to everyone who wasn't able to join the webinar. So stay tuned for that, as well as some of the resources that we talked about sharing um, throughout the webinar. So um, thank you again, you guys. Uh, thank you for the work you do for your chapters. They would not be so wonderful if it weren't for your great leadership. So we really appreciate you. And I look forward to working with you some more this year. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Shaz.
Yes. One more, one more thing um, before everybody leaves. Sorry. Um, we have a chapter awards, um, annual chapter awards. Not many chapters apply for that award. You know, you get anywhere from $1,500 to $500. That's easy money if you're doing fabulous things. And most of you are doing fabulous things. So it will open up around, um, I think, August. Actually, no, earlier this year, June, because the conference in Taiwan is October 6 to 8. Um, I know you. It, it's not necessary that if you get an award, you have to travel to get it. We would love you to be there, but you, you know, we should highlight the chapter. You should consider applying and, I mean, nominating your chapter for an award. Yes, um, there's a question that someone's asking, Noor is asking about number of times. If you've received one award, there are four categories. There's the special uh, award, there's the advocacy, there's programming, and then there is uh, there's um, one more, I'm forgetting. I think it's a special unique program. We have several of those. If you've gotten one award in each category, obviously, um, unless you've had you have an extremely unique program in the same category, like you could do something new uh, in advocacy. Our NCAC uh, chapter did a great event um, on postcards. They 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 wrote postcards to members of Congress and was a part of a, their advocacy initiative. I mean, if they decide to do something else at the local level, which is unique and different, they could still qualify for the advocacy award. The fact is we have these awards and we want to encourage you to do something unique that is highlighted even to State Department and on our website and in our newsletter to all the alumni that what our chapters are doing. So you should, you should, um, I, we have no restriction on how many times you can apply for the same award. It just can't be the same activity. It has to be unique and different, and it has to be an annual activity you do. So I hope that makes sense. Yes, uh, Consuela says focus on impact when telling your story. Um, they, yeah, that was a, you, they got an award last year. They were the only chapter that won. The Houston chapter was the only chapter that won an award last year. Anyway, um, I, I'm going to end it right now. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to speak up. Hi, Chess. This is Wyatt from Nebraska. I have a question regarding my uh, bank letter that you were sending to me. I, I, I noticed some people are logging in and some are leaving, but for those who have just logged into the call, uh, we've just wrapped up the presentation, um, but you can go through the question stream uh, on the side. You can all see that. Uh, we will be sharing this PowerPoint with everyone, as well as the findings of various uh, workshops we've done and notes from this call uh, and sharing it with all the chapter leaders. So. Even if you've missed something, don't worry, you'll get a chance to review it at your convenience. And we were just saying thank you for all the work you do. Thank you. Thank you for a stimulating presentation. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I do want to hear about an advocacy director and a cab rep soon. Please keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.